Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Charles Fernio. He is a professor of psychology at Durham University, where he is also director of the Center for Research into Inner Experience. His background is in developmental psychology with a focus on social, emotional, and cognitive development. He has contributed to the understanding of how language and thought are related in child development and beyond. He is the author of books like Pieces of Light, The New Science of Memory, and The Voices Within, The History and Science of How We Talk to Ourselves. So, Dr. Fernando, welcome to the show. It's a huge pleasure to everyone. Thank you, Ricardo. Thanks for having me on the show. So uh, let's start by talking about inner speech. So psychologically speaking, what is it? What does it correspond to exactly? If you ask people what's going on in their heads when they're doing nothing in particular or when they're busy with a task or when they're walking to work or chopping vegetables in the kitchen, a lot of people say that a lot of the time there's language going on. There are words in their head. They seem to be, it's as if they're talking to themselves silently in their heads. And that's inner speech. You know, it's the language that we use that is directed to ourselves for whatever purpose. And I became interested in where it comes from, what it's like, what it's doing there. Does everybody have it? What are, what are its functions? Mm -hmm. And do we know how early in development children start showing this capacity? Well, my inspiration in this research, which, you know, is an interest of mine for all the time I've been working as a professional psychologist, really. My inspiration was the Soviet psychologist Vygotsky. Mm -hmm. It was working in the 1920s and 1930s, in the early years of the, the, the new Soviet Union. And he had a very simple, but very powerful idea about how all this happens. He thought that children started out as babies, immersed in social exchanges. They're social beings from the very beginning. And they engage in dialogues. They converse with others. Whether that's, that's not immediately through language, because language doesn't kick in usually until about 12 months. Before that, it's to do with gestures and behaviours and emotional expressions and so on. But when language comes along, the capacity for a profound, well, Vygotsky actually called it a revolution in development, emerges. And ch as children learn to use language to regulate what other people are doing around them, they learn to use language to control themselves, basically. So Vygotsky saw children as moving through these three main phases from social speech, where they're talking to other people, using words to interact with others through to a phase that we call private speech, through into a phase we called inner speech. And Vygotsky used the image of language going underground, becoming completely internalized, becoming completely silent. That's really where inner speech comes from, that process, that gradual process over childhood of internalization. So the logic of that is that children won't be using inner speech from the start. It will take some time for them to develop the use of inner speech. So I think that's the most likely conclusion that we can draw, that you very young children who are just starting to use language as toddlers are not doing much internally, but that over time they learn to turn those words back onto themselves. And some of the evidence from neurodevelopment seems to support that idea. Some of the evidence from you know really lovely studies that John Flavel and colleagues did asking young children what they understand about inner speech very very simply you know three three-year-olds don't really get the idea they don't really get the concept which suggests that they don't use it themselves from four onwards children are starting to understand that yeah you can talk to yourself silently in your head so i think all that fits in with Vygotsky's general developmental scheme for where all this comes from mm -hmm. but uh, would it be at any particular age? I mean, would it be that children can have or use inner speech even in the very early stages of language acquisition, or do they have to be 
at least a little bit more proficient, like, for example, at around three, four years of age, something like that? There is some debate about this. I'm on the side that thinks that you probably have the capacity to do in a speech from very early on, in the sense that you've got some internal mechanism for representing phonological information, which you must have in order to use language. But that doesn't mean you use it to talk to yourself. So I think it's almost like the capacity might be there, but it isn't used until it's, it's almost like the kids get the idea, oh, hang on, I can do this. So they turn it around to themselves. So, you know, in terms of cognitive and neural mechanisms, maybe the capacity is there, but it, I think generally it isn't, doesn't start to get used until, until children have that insight that words are something you can turn back onto yourself. And in terms of the timings of that, I'm very cautious about this because everything with development, you know, as soon as you start saying this happens by this age, mm. A, it's wrong, and B, parents start to worry. So, you know, ch children are incredibly varied. Things happen in all sorts of different ways and pathways to all sorts of different timescales. So I would only be very, very vague about when these things happen. We know that m most kids around two, three, four are talking to themselves out loud a lot. That's the stage of private speech. There's mm -hmm. probably already some internalization into inner speech going on around that age. If I had to put money on it, I'd, I'd guess that inner speech often gets going for, for a lot of kids around about that three, four age range. A very interesting thing is why internalization happens. And then we need to look at social and cultural variables. And the simple thing there is kids go to school. They can't, if they find it useful to talk to themselves out loud, that ain't going to work in a room full of 30 elementary school kids, as any teacher will tell you. So I'm not saying that teachers tell kids to shut up, but the whole context of being in a class is that it's not as conducive to talking to yourself out loud, and that's probably quite a good thing. So there's this huge social social thing that comes along around about age five, six, you know, whenever kids go to st start going to school that probably pushes that process of internalization further forward. And approaching things scientifically, of course, uh, we know that we have this uh, psychological capacity, but uh, of course, uh, we also need to ask, why do we have it? And what functions does it serve exactly? Do we know the, the answers to those questions? Well, that's one reason why Vygotsky's work was so interesting to me. And then following him, his student Luria and others, their, their colleagues, really started to ask that question. You know, what's it doing there? What's this language doing there? And there had been a view that it wasn't doing an awful lot. And there still is a view, really, that a lot of this language that pops up into the head is actually just a kind of cheesecake. You know, it's not actually, it's nice, but it's not serving any real function. The real work is going on in a pre-linguistic form. Now, I, I don't hold that view. I think there is evidence that this kind of language does do useful things for us. And a big clue to that is the fact that so many of us do it. You know, we probably wouldn't be doing it in all the different ways that we do it unless there was some purpose to it. So I think inner speech and private speech have a lot of functions, a lot of different functions. Not everybody uses it. They they get to the same end in different ways. But for a lot of people, it's a useful thing to do. So, for example, some of the earliest work by Vygotsky and Luria asked how in a how private speech, you know, and, and presumably also in a speech has a role in planning, you know, working out what you're going to do before you do it. And I think that's just one of the ways in which I, I personally myself, when I reflect on my own inner speech, I, I do a lot of planning. With it, you know, I work out what I'm going to do. But that's just one of many, many functions that I think inner speech has. I think the simple way to express my view on this is that think about what language generally can do. Think about all the different things that language can do, all the different functions that language in general can perform. I don't think there's any function that external language can perform that internal language can't also perform. So the range of functions is just as broad, I think, for inner speech. That means we've got a very complex, sophisticated, varied phenomenon to try to understand. Mm -hmm. Does inner speech, from a developmental perspective, 
relate in any way to how we use concepts and uh, our, our ability to abstract? This is a very interesting topic of research that I've been exploring with the uh, Italian psychologist and linguist Anna Borghi. Um, we've just published a paper, in fact, on this on this topic, where we're, we're just speculating at this stage because we don't have good data yet. Mm. But we speculate that the different kinds of inner speech, because form and function go together. You know, we see mm -hmm. different functions for inner speech, and then we would, we'll also expect to see different forms, you know, different kinds of inner speech. We think that certain kinds of inner speech might be particularly useful for both acquiring and using, like, using concepts, particularly abstract concepts. So we don't really have the good data yet. We're, I'm looking forward to working with Anna Moore um, in the in the years to come about how we can actually sort of get some good data on this. But for example, it might be that when you're trying to get your head around a complex, abstract concept, it might be quite useful to talk to yourself. It might be quite useful to sort of reflect your own developing meanings back at yourself and give yourself a bit of, have a bit of an internal conversation about it. Mm. In which case you might expect that that, kind of inner speech would happen in what we call an expanded form, where you really are having full-blown conversations in full sentences with yourself, rather than the other kind of extreme of inner speech, which we think of as a much more condensed and compressed telegraphic form. So we don't, we don't know yet, but we've got some interesting ideas about how research could start to explore those issues. And what do we know about inner speech from the perspective of neuroscience? Do we know, for example, if there are any specific regions of the brain uh, where uh, inner speech occurs or that allow for inner speech? And also, since we've been also talking here about the relationship between inner speech and, of course, language. Is there any overlapping between the regions where language is processed and the ones where inner speech is or not? Certainly. I mean, I think there are, it's important to say that there are some methodological issues with the way mm -hmm. that inner speech has been studied in the brain scanner. I think we're gradually improving the way we go about it for... for various reasons. But essentially, you'd see, I mean, in, internal language is language, and you'd expect to see a lot of overlap in the areas that activate, mm -hmm. which you do, in fact, see. So one mm -hmm. area you're going to see activating in most sort of paradigms in which you do some kind of inner speech assessment is what we call broker's area. So it's at the left, mm -hmm. um, towards the front of the brain, um, what's known as the left inferior frontal gyrus. We know that damage, we've known for you know 100 and whatever years, that damage to that area causes a real problem in generating speech. We see it activate when people use language in the scanner. And in a lot of studies, we see it activating when people are using inner speech. So that kind of wouldn't surprise me really to see that area activating. It also activates with a whole load of other functions and a whole load of other things that our minds do, you know, all, all sorts of sophisticated carefully time sequenced actions will draw on broker's area as well so that's not kind of mind-blowing really that that area activates but very simply there's a there's a kind of loop that we think is established between broker's area towards the front on the left and what we call Wernicke's area slightly further back in the temporal lobes on the left where there seems to be this sort of reverberating loop the the sort of brain speaking and listening to itself in in this continuous process. So I'm pretty sure that that network is going to be important for inner speech. But what we've tried to do is really challenge the idea that inner speech is just one thing. That was, that was the starting point. Inner mm -hmm. speech isn't just one droning voice in your head. Inner speech has all these different functions. And then if Vygotsky's right, it should take all these different forms. So let's try and break down those little forms. Let's ask about what kind of inner speech we're talking about. And then let's see if we can start to establish the neural signatures of those different kinds. So one of the things that we've done is I mentioned that inner speech develops from private speech, which in turn develops from social speech. Now, social speech is a dialogue, often usually 
you know, we talk, we talk to each other, we exchange perspectives. So is private speech. You know, by that logic, that dialogic structure should be carried forward into private and then into inner speech. So inner speech often does seem to us to be a kind of conversation with, with ourselves where we're representing different perspectives. So what we asked in one study is, what's the neural signature of specifically that dialogic inner speech where you are representing different perspectives to yourself? You'd expect that language system in the left hemisphere to activate, but would you also expect to see other parts of the neural system? For example, the parts, the, the networks that we know underpin social cognition, thinking about other minds, what we call theory of mind. Would you expect to see them activating as well? And in one study, a bit of a preliminary study, but we've, we have actually replicated the findings um, already. We do find this sort of crosstalk between the left hemisphere language system and something that's actually further over on the right hemisphere tied in with what we know to be an important network for social cognition. So it's like to do dialogic in a speech, yes, you've got to be able to do the basic language, but you've also got to be able to represent those other perspectives. So it's like you need a whole other system to come in and connect up and plug in before you can get that kind of inner speech going. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is perhaps a, a silly question, I'm not sure, but uh, since one of the ways of studying in neuroscience the regions of the brain that are responsible for processing different functions or are activated when people are performing different cognitive functions is to study uh, lesions or damages to the brain and to specific regions. Uh, I mean, when it comes to language, language, language production and comprehension, I would imagine that it's uh, in comparison to inner speech, it's easier because we can uh, directly observe that the, there's a, for example, a speech impediment or something like that. But when it comes to inner speech, uh, is there any way to know if the ability is damaged apart from self-reporting? Uh, it's a good question. It's a very good question. The whole study of the aphasias for the topic of inner speech is, is an interesting one. And the, the data seem to pull in different directions. I mean, there are some cases where people have profound um, problems in producing external language and then lose their inner speech as well. But others where they have the same problems in producing language, but they've got continuing inner speech. So, so the findings are a bit weird and they're, they're, I don't think we've made sense of them yet. We need to do much more on this topic of looking at how the study of aphasia um, can, can help us to understand inner speech. But I think fundamentally inner speech is a psychological phenomenon that has a phenomenology it's something we're conscious of doing it's something that happens to us as people as minds so i think you know scanning someone's brain and deciding whether they're doing inner speech or not is 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 a bit nonsensical i think what we need to do instead is try and triangulate subjective report which you can do in all sorts of ways using you know, really quite sophisticated methods triangulate that with neuroimaging triangulate that with behavioral studies so what we can do is knock out the ability to use language temporarily just by getting somebody to do another task get them using a task get them doing a task that blocks up that uses all of the capacity of their language system then they shouldn't be able to do any inner speech so if you think inner speech is important for something there should be a decrement in that in that in performance on that task so you know there are all these different ways that we can have and if we can cleverly and you know with the right sort of methodological framework triangulate then i think we'll start to get somewhere mm -hmm. and of course inner speech plays a very prominent role in certain mental disorders like for example uh, i would imagine psychosis depression particularly when it comes to ruminative thought and stuff like that. So uh, have you also studied that uh, ruminative thought, for example, and how it's connected to all kinds of different mental disorders? 
Yeah, we have done a bit of work on rumination. And the interesting thing there is, that, as you say, it is really important in theorizing about anxiety, depression, and so on. But very few people have actually thought of it as a kind of inner speech, which it clearly mm -hmm. is. If, if rumination happens in words, that's inner speech. Mm -hmm. So there's this whole job of work to do to connect the rumination literature together with the inner speech literature. I think we'll find yeah. some really interesting things if we do that. But, you know, I mentioned people use inner speech probably because it's useful to them. Mm -hmm. It is in a lot of cases, but it has a downside. I think anything that human beings do, you know, has an upside and probably also has a downside as well. You know, it can go wrong. It can be used for the wrong purposes. And inner speech has this downside, which is that it can be used to think unhelpful thoughts, you know, to put mm -hmm. into words thoughts that you really are probably better off not having or not doing, not having so many of. And that's where rumination, for example, would come in. Negative thoughts about the self can, can kind of get caught up in inner speech and inner speech then becomes the main vehicle in which they're rehearsed. So it's another reason for thinking that understanding this phenomenon could be really beneficial it definitely isn't all you know a sunny outlook there are def there are definitely downsides and, and negative aspects to inner speech mm -hmm. but uh, just to be sure that i understood it correctly those these two different areas of study uh, inner speech on the one hand and rumination on the other have not intersected uh, a lot yet Right. Not, not very much, no. We've done a little bit on the topic, as I say, but uh, I think there's much more to do to ask, you know, in the clin clinical literature, are these ruminations happening in language? If so, you've got a whole way into understanding how, how they're working, why they may be so persistent, how they can be treated, perhaps. Mm hmm so this could probably open some new pathways into treating and better have a better understanding of how of the inner workings let's say of some mental disorders or at least some symptoms of mental disorders correct? i think so it hasn't been a major focus for me but i think it's wide open for people to come along and explore that connection just have a look at the inner speech literature and see what can be gained for understanding rumination particularly in a therapeutic context mm -hmm. so uh changing topics a little bit of course i think they are both these topics are both very well connected uh why do children have imaginary companions and is this something that uh, uh, a propensity that all children tend to have or not at all well, socially such an interesting phenomenon because it's been mm. understood in very different ways over the decades you know if going back to the mid 20th century you probably would have had a, a fair number of people thinking that imaginary companions or imaginary friends or a sign of something going wrong mentally, a sign of future mental illness, a sign of the child was sort of disappearing into a fantasy world and could start hallucinating and, and, and so on. That view is completely changed thanks to some careful research by people like Marjorie Taylor and, and her colleagues, where they've just tried to be systematic about the study of children's imaginary companions without and approach it without prejudice, without thinking, you know, this is a symptom of mental illness. Mm -hmm. looked and said really the same sort of question I've been asking about in a speech what are they doing there what are they for are they helping are they what are they offering to the, ch the child so we now think that somewhere between one third and two thirds of kids have imaginary companions mm -hmm. so roughly speaking as many do as don't they seem to have some they seem to be associated with some positive developmental outcomes so some kids who um, so kids who have imaginary companions have, sh have been shown to be doing slightly better on theory of mind abilities. Mm -hmm. so they have a better understanding of other people's minds. It kind of makes sense because with an imaginary companion, a, a friend who isn't there, an invisible friend or else an, an object that becomes personified, um, so it has its own sort of identity like a teddy bear or something, you're kind of creating another mind for yourself to interact with. And that seems to be one reason why children do it. 
it's another friend, you know, it's another mind to interact with. It can be useful in acquiring some social skills of, you know, learning how to interact with others, learning how to talk to, to others. So I don't think it's at all anything to worry about. Um, as I say, it seems to be associated with some, at least, positive developmental outcomes. Mm. We don't know why they happen. We do know there is some, an interesting line of research which just suggests that they aren't necessarily under the children's control all the time, mm. which is another reason why they might happen, in fact, because they might d- provide children with some useful experience in in dealing with other with kind of refractory points of view with other minds that don't do as they're told so there's there's some research on what, what are called non-compliant imaginary companions where the imaginary friend doesn't do what they're told and can even in some cases cause some distress in how badly behaved they are or how nasty they are to the child and so on so i think that's a really interesting topic of future research of you know asking you know, how, what are the different forms that imaginary companions take? What are the different functions that they seem to have? But also, I think that we can start to extend the study of imaginary com- companions out beyond childhood. So mm. very few people had asked the question of whether um, adults have imaginary companions. Now, a study we did um, just a couple of years ago we, we had quite a big sample of people and we asked them and we found, I think it was something like 7%. So it's not, you know, it's less than 10%, but there's still a decent number of adults who say they have an imagined companion now. That becomes very interesting when you think about the way that, <clears throat> for example, writers create fictional characters who are these sort of mm-hmm. other entities in their head who they interact with. And also, in particular, the the rise of tulpamancy, of the creation of um, uh, fictional entities, particularly in a sort of internet um, context where people create mm-hmm. what, what are called tulpas, who are these basically adult adult imaginary friends. They're, they're entities that they that people have a relationship with, have a sense of their character, have a sense of what they look like, and so on. And that's become quite a big thing and there's starting to be some interesting research on that phenomenon i think it's it's a it's another form of of imaginary friends and maybe has some of the benefits that imaginary companions have in childhood as well Mm -hmm. so uh, according at least to our current scientific understanding of it uh, creating imaginary companions is part of normal child development Right. Well, then, then I get into the problem. I give talks on this topic and, and I, I get parents coming up to me afterwards and say, my child doesn't have an imaginary friend. Should I be worried? And I'm like, <laughs> it's all fine. It's some kids do, some kids don't. You know, I've got two kids. One of them had a very rich uh, fantasy life as a child. The other one, not so much. They're both, mm. you know, fantastic, you know, wonderful young adults. No, no problems at all. So really it's not something for anyone to worry about it's not something for anyone to um beat themselves up over um it's just an it's a natural part of human variation some mm-hmm. do some don't um and really that's all we can that's all we can say mm-hmm. but even if we're still not sure why uh, that happens why at least certain children Uh, develop that uh, capacity Uh, do we know if when they have imaginary friends uh, if they influence other aspects of their psychology like for example how they think about and characterize their real life friends yeah so uh, a student of mine Paige Davis is now doing research in her own lab on this same topic um, and as one of the studies she did is asking looking to see you know getting a group of kids with imaginary companions a group of kids without imaginary companions and looking to see how those groups differed in how they described their own their own real life friends 
mm-hmm. and she found that the imaginary companions group they tended to have take a more mentalistic um, or what we call mind minded approach to their real life friends so they're more likely to describe their real life friends in terms of their mental characteristics Hmm. now that to me fits with earlier findings that kids with imaginary companions do better on theory of mind tasks it's almost like you these kids have a slightly enhanced understanding of other people's minds you can then ask the question which way round is it do they start out with sort of better theory of mind and then part of that is developing imaginary friends or is it the other way around it's actually interacting mm-hmm. with imaginary friends that teaches you something about other minds we don't really know yet but my hunch is it's the latter it's probably a bit of both but i think the latter is going on to a certain extent it seems to me to make sense that if you are interacting with other people you're learning about other minds and that's the case even if those other people don't actually exist Mm-hmm. Uh, are imaginary companions all verbal? I mean, do they also have speech always, just sometimes? Uh, how does it work exactly? Well, I think there's a huge variation. I don't think we have really good data on the phenomenology of imaginary companions. We do know, we do know that they're very varied. And some will mm-hmm. speak, some won't, some will appear sort of visually to the child, some won't. Some, as I say, are just objects, you know, a teddy bear that has its own mind. But, you know, presumably the teddy bear doesn't get up and walk around, you know, the teddy bear is just sitting there, but it's it's a person. So you get, you get a lot of uh, variation, but I'd say pretty much anything goes. I think, you know, some kids have a really rich perceptually rich experiences of their imagined companions and others less so mm-hmm. so would you say that the research on inner speech uh, might intersect at least to some extent with the research on imaginary companions well that yeah i think that's a good question and one of the Well, one of the things we found is that we found slight differences in this large sample of people, adults, who were reporting on whether they'd had imaginary friends in in childhood. Um, we found that the kids, the people, the adults who'd had imaginary companions, they, their inner speech tended to be a bit more dialogic. Mm-hmm. Um, it also showed their inner speech tended to show a feature that we found in a, in a few studies now, Where we, we see that there's a there's a factor that we call other voices mm-hmm. in inner speech. Right. And this has come out in a few studies. It's, this our questionnaire on it has been replicated in a few places around the world. This other voices factor seems to relate to the extent to which you hear other people speaking in your inner speech. So this might be mm-hmm. hearing somebody hearing hearing somebody talk to you silently in your head. Or it might be having a conversation with somebody in your head. People do reliably, not not everyone, not everyone does, but a, a significant minority of people do endorse the items on this other voices subscale. And we we found that the in a, the, the the adults who'd had it in imaginary companions in childhood showed slightly more of this other voices in inner speech. Going on, which I, again I think makes sense in that you know an imaginary friend is is another voice in your head to a certain mm-hmm. extent. So that's that's one way in which I think about drawing that link. Mm-hmm. I would like to ask you now about another topic of your research that is auditory verbal hallucination. So um, the first question I would like to ask you is. Is this kind of hallucination a social phenomenon? Yeah, it's a very good question, which has really been brought into the forefront in in recent years by the work of people like Vaughan Bell, Sam Wilkinson, who have asked, you know, what's what's going on with auditory verbal hallucinations in terms of, you know, you're being you're hearing a voice in your head. There's nobody else around. It's often seen, it can be a very distressing experience, and it's often associated with severe mental illness, such as 
schizophrenia, but also it's associated with a whole range of other psychiatric diagnoses. Mm -hmm. But then it also happens to a lot of people who are not mentally ill, who wouldn't meet any criterion for being mentally ill. So, so what's going on? You hear a voice in your head talking to you or talking about you or or whatever. That To what extent is that a social experience? To what extent are you, instead of hallucinating a sound, you're kind of hallucinating a person? So, so it's a new area of research that has just become, just come to the forefront in recent years, as I say, where people are thinking about what is the social structure of auditory verbal hallucinations and how might they rely on, how might they involve the kind of systems that we know are important for representing other people's minds. We've already talked about them. We talked about social cognition. We talked about theory of mind. To what extent are those sorts of social representations important in hallucinated voices and there's much more to learn what we are finding is that if you if you talk to people with a diagnosis diagnosis of psychosis for example so we we did a study on um some people who uh were receiving early intervention services for psychosis and we asked them we gave them very detailed in-depth interviews about their voices and in, and in particular, we, we asked them about the extent to which their voices took on particular personalities or characters. So some people will say their voice is just like this vague, non-specific, often distressing, abusive, negative, you know, message, communication coming to them. Mm -hmm. Other people will say that they've got really clearly identifiable Voices where they can say what the person's character is like and you know, provide information about different aspects of their character and their agent of qualities and so on. So we, we found that about 40% of our sample had what we call complex personification. So it's more than just saying it's the voice of a young woman or it's the voice of an older man or you know somebody speaking Portuguese or whatever. You know, it's more than that. It's more, it's building up a, a more of a sense of a, a rounded person behind the voice. So yeah, about 40% of these um, participants reported complex personification. And we found that, you know, we, you know, you could argue that those highly personified voices might be associated with more traumatic or more commanding um, voice experiences so it, it might be that if you've got a particular person in your head they might be more likely to say go and do this or remind you of trauma from your own life we didn't actually find that we found that their ex people's experience of of these voices was more to do it was more associated with how conversational they found the relationship mm. with the voice and also how companionable companionable the voices are so i think this, this fits with the idea that when people hear voices, <clears throat> there are all sorts of processes of meaning making, of narrativizing, of making sense of that experience. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that seems to happen is that people start to give identities to their voice. In some cases, people start to give identities to those voices and start to enter into relationships with them. And that can, that a lot of research is showing that that. <clears throat> building of relationships or, or understanding that there is a relationship can be quite important therapeutically. Mm -hmm. But uh, what you just described, uh, can it also happen to people who do not have any sort of uh, mental condition, mental disorder or anything like that? Yeah, we think a, 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 an important minority of people have quite frequent voice hearing experiences but are not um not they're not mentally ill they're not distressed mm -hmm. there's no reason for them to seek any psychiatric help and we've worked with a group of people who um a particular group of people who fit into that we think fit into that character category um spiritualists so mm -hmm. people who report the experience of hearing um deceased people speaking to them really interesting group of people to work with who are very interested in talking about their experiences 
and who have formed in, in, in a few studies of ours have formed a kind of non-clinical voice hearing group because they're having voice hearing experiences they are hearing voices they're not mentally ill and that's been quite a useful um group for us to work with not least because they're so interesting and their experiences are so interesting but because it provides us with a group of voice hearers who really are hearing voices but don't have everything else that's going on for you if you have a diagnosis of psychosis mm -hmm. how much do we know about the neuroscience of auditory verbal hallucinations uh, i've read in your work for example about alterations in resting state networks and the default mode network would you like to tell us about that and perhaps other alterations that you might know of or might have studied yourself yeah i mean it's been an important development in neuroscience in the last 30 years or so this recognition that the brain when it's at rest is not doing nothing it doesn't just close down it doesn't go to sleep like your computer it's ticking over more like your car you know your car engine is ticking over all the time and all the varied networks of the brain at least some of them continue to stay active when you're doing nothing you're doing nothing in particular there's no task you're not being asked to do anything to watch anything to respond in any way so this so-called resting state <clears throat> of the brain has been connected to a number of re so-called resting state networks that um, are, are of different, you know, some are more famous than others, but there's more than just one of them. And we find that um, when you look at, you, you can do clever analyses to see how different parts of the brain are talking to each other, even in the resting state, even when nothing in particular is going on. So it's like how much of these networks tied into each other even when there's no particular task being performed now going back to what i said earlier about this language network or this this sort of resonating loop between broca's area and wernicke's area if you translate that into the question of resting state networks then you end up with a view that maybe that kind of looping round of the what, whatever's going on in the um in the frontal region, the frontal portion of the language network, that might be in a resting state, differently connected to that bit further back in the temporal lobe. So people have studied this resting state, so-called functional connectivity between temporal and frontal areas. And indeed they find, I mean, I think the data are a little bit messy, but there seems to be something going on in the sense that there, there are different patterns of resting state connectivity between those two bits of the language system, which kind of fits quite nicely with what we already knew about how those systems work. And there's some interesting um, differences as well in how those um, networks connect, in particular in relation to what's known as the default mode network, which is a, a network that sort of runs through the, through the middle of your brain and it sort of aligned around the midline of the brain and that's particularly important in mind wandering in in social cognition in internally focused thoughts there seems to be some things going on there in relation to just how how the brain is wired up even at rest and seems to relate to people's tendency to have auditory hallucinations but also other kinds of hallucinations including the visual I don't think we have a, a good picture. I don't think we have good theories yet about how, what exactly is going on um, in the brain with auditory verbal hallucinations, not least because they're so varied. And we need to be so, asking the same question as we've been asking about inner speech, which is, you know, let's move beyond the idea that this is just one thing and let's break it down into all the different kinds of auditory verbal hallucination, including, for example, personified hallucinations. Let's break it down let's do more specific studies then we might start to get a clearer picture of what's going on in the brain mm -hmm. so i'm not sure if you agree with what i'm about to say but uh it uh, then i think we can say that by studying for example what happens in the brain the kind of alterations we see when people experience auditory verbal hallucinations and even in other conditions where other alterations might occur uh, 
we not just learn more about the condition itself, like uh, uh, an hallucination in this case, but uh, we might also learn more about how those underlying processes uh, and mechanisms, like, for example, the default mode network, uh, work, correct? Absolutely, yeah. I think we can learn a lot about general cognition and neuroscience from, from studying phenomena such as hallucinations, for sure. Mm -hmm. So uh, when people hear these voices, do they tend to attribute any sort of specific personal identity to them, psychological traits, agency, or anything like that? Well, as I said, personific the study of personification is, is you know, emerging as an interesting new area. We, we think that, that people vary in how much these voices become personified that probably has implications for how well they can deal with them, mm -hmm. probably has implications for the kind of therapy that they might benefit from if they if they find the voice is distressing. So I think that's all, um, it's all up for grabs. I think we're, we're starting to ask the right questions. Um, and I think, you know, the study of regular imaginary companions can be very interesting. In this respect as well it's some intriguing findings that the people who hear voices who are least affected by them are the people who've had them for longest so mm. the, the people whose onset of voices was earlier in childhood earlier in adolescence let's say because i don't mm -hmm. think we have the good data going all the way back into childhood those, those, the relationships with their voices tend to be more positive, the voices are more benign. Now, that's, that's a preliminary finding. You know, one or two studies have shown that. I think there's, there's probably something there that will link in with imaginary companions, but we need to do much more research to address that question. And I think it's going to involve big, therefore expensive, longitudinal studies where you follow people up over you know, a long period of time, 20 years or so, that that's when we'll start to get some interesting data on on that topic. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to auditory hallucinations, are there also musical hallucinations? Absolutely. I mean, musical hallucinations have been <clears throat> described in the neurological literature for a long, long time. Um, and they seem to be, you know, reasonably common. Um, what one thing that is extremely common is what we call earworms, which is where you have the sense of a song or a tune going around in your head and you just can't get rid of it and you're not under it's not under your voluntary control at all. It can be really annoying. Mm -hmm. It's not really a hallucination in the sense that you kind of know where it's come from. You you sort of know the experience, you know it's a uh, it's not you're not really hearing you know you're not having the experience of really hearing music when there's no music presence present but there hasn't really been that much work to tie those experiences together uh, so we just started um we did a, a fairly large online survey um with you know, more than more than 250 people we found 44 people out of that group had proper musical hallucinations um where they would have experiences that um were had the sense of a perception of something that wasn't actually present and that there was something you know that felt real about the experience so therefore um categorizing it as a as a proper hallucination that was a, a self-selected sample by the way we actually were asking we went out to look for people with unusual experiences so it's not that 44 44 out of 270 people have musical hallucinations. I think the numbers would be much lower than that. But we we had enough of them in our sample to be able to ask um, some questions. We found, for example, that the people we asked about people's own musical expertise. You know, to the extent to which they played an instrument, had had musical training, and so on. The people with more musical expertise <clears throat> were less likely to report the musical hallucinations. 
which is cool. maybe interesting from the point of view of composition. And maybe if you're highly trained as a musician, anything like that will come out through you actually creating music in a way that you might not be able to do if you're not if you're not so uh, musically trained. So I think it's a it's one study we've done. I'd love to do much more on that topic, but haven't been able to just yet. Right. Um, so I've asked you about auditory hallucinations. Uh, what are multimodal hallucinations and are there different categories of them, for example? Yeah, this is a, another interesting newish topic of research where people are starting to move away from, I think, the idea that it's voices that matter most in terms of clinical significance. And I think that's something that goes back to the earliest days of psychiatry, really, that the voice always seemed to be so important. It's almost like people would say, if you're hearing voices, then you're really mad. I mean, never mind whatever else you might be seeing or touching or sensing. Hallucinations happen in all the modalities. Um, but in psychosis, it's most common to have them in the auditory modality. Mm. But I think that's one reason why all research got focused on the voices. But people have moved away from that. There's a lot more research going on in vi with visual hallucinations now. And we've been doing some research in where those two things overlap. So a multimodal hallucination is one where well, there's different ways of understanding it. Some people will say it's where well, the same person has hallucinations in more than one modality. So this person sometimes hears something, sometimes sees something, sometimes touches something. Mm -hmm. That's one le less interesting way of thinking about it, I think. Uh, much more interesting from my point of view is when somebody hears an entity, but also sees it. Mm -hmm. So a very simple example, you have, you hear a dog barking and you look around and there you see the dog. Okay. That's a multimodal hallucination. And what's particularly special about that hallucination is that the two modalities, the two sensory channels are happening at the same time. So it's a simultaneous multimodal hallucination. But it's also what we call semantically congruent. What I mean by that is that the meanings of the two different things align. So you hear a dog and you see a dog and it makes sense that it's, an, it's the same entity. It's not like you hear a bell ringing, but you see a dog. That, that wouldn't be congruent. That wouldn't make a lot of sense. It does happen, but the particularly inter interesting ones for me are where they everything aligns like, like that. And it seems that um, people with psychosis, the, the rates of these hallucinations are actually quite high, much higher than I expected before I saw the, this particular data. So I think they're getting missed a lot because of this focus on the voice. I think a lot of psychiatric assessments have not been picking up on them to the extent that they might. It also seems to be that these multimodal ones um, can be more distressing. And I think that kind of fits because, you know, hallucinating a dog is one thing. But if you're hallucinating an unpleasant entity, you know, a person who abused you or traumatized you or a negative, you know, a, a nasty supernatural figure, the devil or something like that. You know, hearing the devil speak, not very nice, but hearing the devil speak and seeing him, mm -hmm. you can imagine that being even more distressing. So mm -hmm. there's some evidence that those those particular multimodal hallucinations are more distressing. And I think that's going to be very important for the future in understanding what to do about them in terms of therapy. But uh, can these multimodal hallucinations involve uh, all of the senses, like, for example, not just uh, visual and auditory, can they also be olfactory, for example? Yes. yes. I mean, that hasn't been studied as much. Most of the focus has been on auditory and visual combined, because that's the most common thing. But you do you do find bits of crossover with the other modalities as well i think that's what you would expect and that you know that's interesting going back to the thing we talked about earlier in relation when you asked whether auditory verbal hallucinations are social phenomena and you may mm -hmm. remember i said the question is well a way of thinking about the question is is it that you're hallucinating a voice 
the mm -hmm. sound of some kind? Or is it that you're hallucinating a person? Mm -hmm. Now, I think if you're hallucinating a person, if it's more like that latter um, scenario, then I think it's actually much more likely that that if that person representation gets activated, that those other sensory modalities will also get activated. So I think that way of thinking about hallucinations as being personified as being involving representations of people gives us a, a way of testing out some of these ideas in relation to multimodal hallucinations. Mm -hmm. so, when so you, when you see the devil and you hear the devil, it might mm -hmm. be because your kind of devil representation is getting activated. The whole thing is getting activated. And then why not? Why not smell him and, you know, touch, feel, feel his touch and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so earlier you've mentioned how it's not just people who suffer from certain mental conditions that experience hallucinations. Uh, people do not have to suffer from any of that to also experience them sometimes. But is there a way of distinguishing uh, precisely between clinical and non-clinical hallucinations? Are there specific cognitive mechanisms associated with each of them? It's a good question. Um, some people in the past, well, a lot of people in the past have said the key difference is what psychiatrists call insight. Mm -hmm that if you, people who hear voices but aren't distressed by them have insight, they know that they're not actually hearing something real. I don't think that idea stands up particularly well in relation to the evidence. It's, I'm sure it's important, but I don't think it's the answer. Another thing that's been proposed is that people who, people who are really mentally ill have what we have a full blown proper hallucination. Whereas people who, um, who are not mentally ill, who are the, what we would call the non-clinical voice hearers, have what's called a pseudo-hallucination. And there's been all sorts of, I think, fairly spurious ideas about how if it's a true hallucination, it seems to be coming from outside the head, whereas if it's a pseudo-hallucination, it, it feels like it's coming from inside the head. There's no evidence to support that view at all that I can see. In fact, the evidence points to there being no relation between those two ideas, but somehow that idea is, has stuck. Um, we're gradually trying to overturn it, but um, I think more interesting is to ask, you know, get together a group of patients with psychosis, get together a group of people who, with non-clinical voices and, and give them some tasks and give them some interviews and just find out more about their experiences. So in a recent paper on this, we, we compared that group of, patients with psychosis that I mentioned, and then that group of spiritualists who were hearing regular spiritual voices. And we gave them a bunch of different cognitive tasks, each of which had been implicated in um, hallucinations in the past. And we find they showed slightly different patterns. So for example, both of the groups um, showed atypical performance on what we call a signal detection task, which is where your task is to listen to some white noise and pick out when, when there's an actual voice being spoken. Mm -hmm. Both groups showed that um, atypical performance. But the patients with psychosis showed that and then atypical performance on a couple of other tasks, which the non-clinical participants weren't didn't show any difference on. So I think it's that careful looking at cognitive profiles, looking at the profiles of how people describe the voices qualitatively, trying to tie it all together, accepting that things happen in lots of different ways. There are lots of different kinds of voices. There's lots of different kinds of, of non-clinical voices. I, you know, our group was a, a group hearing regular spiritual voices, but there are other kinds as well. So just breaking things down and trying to be much more specific and, and sophisticated about how we go about it seems to be the the way forward as far as I can see. Mm -hmm. But would you think it'd be correct to say that, for example, during our conversation, we talked about imaginary companions, different kinds of hallucinations. Mm 
that uh, it makes sense to talk about a continuum between what is non-clinical and what is clinical? I mean, the, does do you think it makes sense to completely, uh, discreetly separate the two categories? Yeah, I think my answer is it's got to be something in the middle. I think there are continua and discontinua mm -hmm. in this. It's not it's not as simple as there's a group of people who have psychosis and there's everybody else. That's too simplistic. Mm -hmm. It's not as simple as that there's just one long curve and you know people with psychosis are right at the end of one long curve. I think that's far too simplistic as well. I think there's likely to be multiple continua but also multiple discontinua. And the only way, it's a very, very complicated picture. And the only way we're going to get it right is to be much more specific and not lump together things that shouldn't actually, people who shouldn't be lumped together, tasks that shouldn't be lumped together. Just break it down and, and be much more sophisticated about how we approach things. And, and part of that for me, that I feel very strongly about how we approach understanding the mind in general is that we've got to think about levels of explanation mm -hmm. and what i mean by that is that uh, we differ you know your brain my brain you and me as person pe as people everybody differs <coughs> on all sorts of levels of explanation you know from the chemical all the way up to the cultural and all of those are important you know the chemical the neural the cognitive the personal, the social, the cultural, they're all important ways of understanding why things work out this way for this person, they work out that way for, for that person. And particularly with something like voices, where cultural influences are so strong. And, you know, the differences in, in the outcomes of people who are hearing voices in different countries around the world, for example, can be really striking. So, what we've tried to do is say, let's let's look at all that complexity, but let's also think about complexity at different levels of explanation. And you might find that at one level of explanation, you've got a continuum. Mm -hmm. And at the next level down or the next level up, you've got a discontinuum. And that's somehow all got to be brought into, into focus. Mm -hmm. So would it be right to say that when it comes to these sort of mental experiences, uh, it there wouldn't be an approach, uh, a, a one size fits all approach that, but we also have to take into account all sorts of different factors, including sociological, cultural factors and individual variation. Yeah, I don't think there's any particular kind of experience that somebody could walk through the door of your clinic and say, I'm having this kind of experience that could lead you to say, right, you're in this category. I think mm -hmm. whatever you say about hallucinations, you'll find somebody on the street who's having the same thing, but who mm -hmm. isn't mentally ill, who's not distressed by it, who might be having a very unusual kind of internal life compared to what you're used to, but isn't ill. The key thing, it keeps coming back to distress. You know, Is this person distressed by what's happening to them? Because the person mm -hmm. next door might be having the same thing and isn't distressed. Trying to understand why one person is distressed and the other isn't is as complex as trying to understand human beings. And we're certainly not going to unpick it at the neural level of explanation or the cognitive level of explanation. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't know if you agree, but I, I think that just, and this is, I mean, we're wrapping up the conversation now, but I think that just uh, from what we talked about today, I get the idea that uh, even by studying uh, single topics like hallucinations, imaginary companions, and all of that, uh, it can uh, connect to many different areas and even to broader questions in psychology, neuroscience, and so on, including things like what is mental illness, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, we learn so much about minds in general from studying minds that, from some perspectives, might seem a little bit unusual. Yeah.
Okay, so uh, Dr. Ferniho, uh, just before we go, uh, would you like to tell people where they can find your work on the internet? Yeah, you can go to my website, which is charlesferniho.com. Um, I've got a whole load of media um, up there. I did a lot of things when my book, The Voices Within, came out um, a few years ago. It's been translated into a few languages. I don't think Portuguese yet. So if any Portuguese publishers want to translate it, you'll find it. Uh, it will go down very well. Okay, great. So I will be leaving links to your work and, of course, including your books in the description box of this interview. And thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. It's been a pleasure too. Thank you, Ricardo. Lovely to talk to you. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting the channel on Patreon or PayPal. You can find the links in the description box of this interview. And if you like this interview, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development Done Differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett, Perurga Larsen, Jerry Mueller, Hans Frederick Sunde, Bernardo Seixas, Herbert Gintis, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Visser, Adam Castle, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Henry Calenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassio, Zup, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Cavana, Jorge Pinha, Michael Stormir, Samuel Andre, Francis Ford, Tiago Nunes, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Harl Herzog, Nuno Machado, Jonathan Leibrand, João Linhares, Stan Dante, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Weira, Tom Hamel, Sardas France, David Sloan Wilson, Yacila Dez Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Al Ortiz, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, Saima Fzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wisman, Morten Eichland, Dr. Bird, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Mau Maria, Paul Jorge Arnaud, Luke Loaki, Jorge Teófanos, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Ruth Towell, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Murray, Alex Chow, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Pedro Bonilla, Ziegler, João Barbosa, Bangalore Atheists, Larry D. Lee Jr., Old Erringbone, Sterry, Michael Bailey, and then Sperber. A special thanks to my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Tom Venegdam, Bernard Hugni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Giancarlo Montenegro, and Robert Lewis, and to my executive producers, Michel Rujewski, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.